Good morning, Sun Coast.
So that's how we feel this morning. It is so great to hear, be here with you all. I'm gonna make this one a quick one. We have, just as a reminder, we have a Ren Collective concert coming up next weekend, next Sunday at seven o'clock. Now, if you guys haven't seen Ren Collective, especially live, they are absolutely incredible. It is a concert that you do not want to miss, and you'll see a little preview of it in a little bit. Um, but some exciting news that we just got confirmation on this week. Chris Llewellyn, who is the lead singer of Rent Collective, will be joining us next Sunday morning for both services. He has uh, put out a solo album uh, that's kind of a, a lot of just like personal stuff, and some of the songs on there really resonate with a lot of people, and we're gonna be talking to him about those songs, and he's gonna be actually be performing them here on a Sunday morning, next Sunday morning. So the same day as the concert, so you do not wanna miss the morning services and the concert that night. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing Sunday. So we're thankful that you guys are here, and uh, we're gonna keep going, all right? All right, let's do it.
There's nothing on the private inside now. No longer bound to things of wood and stone. When all I had to offer was my words, you saw my heavy heart and loved me first. Your beauty staring down my broken. Just to throw your heart into the mess. Compassion crashing down on what was left. You were there. And all this time, like a river running through my fingers, you carried me all this time.
As I walk now through the valley Sun Coast. Good morning, friends. I'm Dr. Troy Doucet, one of the teaching pastors here at Sun Coast. We're so glad you're with us, whether you're live in person or watching one of the live streams online. Just a few quick announcements before I get cranked up. Today is Communion Sunday. So we usually do it the first Sunday of the month, but we have a special holiday on the first Sunday of the month coming up. So right after this worship experience and the teaching, Pastor Brett will lead communion right here in this corner. So if you want to participate in the partaking of communion, just come over here, have a seat, and uh, Pastor Brett will do his, his pontification through communion with us. 
Today I get to crank up a three-week series that's going to lead us into Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the Sunday in which Jesus enters into Jerusalem for Holy Week that leads ultimately to his execution. And our lead pastor, Dr. Larry Bauckham, will be leading the services and teaching on Palm Sunday and Easter. So you're with me for the next three weeks as we take this journey with Jesus up until his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And I'm calling this three-week series Triggered. Triggered. So I'm going to ask sort of a rhetorical question throughout my, my sermon today, my teaching. Are you triggered? Because my bet would be at some point you will be. And I want to relate this to the journey that Jesus is on because there are three very significant events that Jesus finds himself embroiled in that are sort of the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back of these religious leaders of his time. And these three episodes that we're going to look at over the next three weeks beginning today ultimately lead these religious leaders to make desperate and drastic decisions that ultimately lead to Jesus' arrest a mockery of a trial, a public beating and humiliation, and of course, his crucifixion on a Roman torture device. So what was it that Jesus said in these three events that led these men, that triggered these men so vehemently to actually want to execute this man publicly? What did Jesus do that so triggered the religious leaders who were supposed to be all about who God is, God is love. What triggered them in, in Jesus' actions that they actually wished he would die in the most horrific way? Those are big questions I'm going to tackle, but I think the most important question for us is to think about this question. In light of the historical and cultural context of these events involving Jesus, his heated confrontations with the so-called religious leaders of his time, his continuous defiant challenge to the accepted religious beliefs and laws of his time, as well as the radical provoking of the status quo that he brought about. Here's my question for us. Would we have been triggered by Jesus if we were there? Would we have been? I love the name of this series because it's really appropriate for us as American citizens in our day and age, psychologists relate being triggered to a number of things. One is what we call PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Simple things in a person's life like seeing a familiar place, smelling a particular aroma, or even thinking about a certain time of year can trigger a person to have an emotional response because of some traumatic or horrific event in their past life. But in the case of this series... I'm going to use a different definition. We're not going to go into our background of hor horrific or traumatic events. But rather, I'm going to look at what psychologists call being triggered by this simple and immediate feeling of fierce emotional reaction to certain things that occur in our life. Not always traumatic, but sometimes people are triggered by being disrespected or insulted. Some people are triggered by having a belief that they strongly have held their whole life being challenged or even disproven. Some people are triggered by having this heightened sense of insecurity or self-doubt. And other people I've seen in my life that they are triggered because their own expectations and predictions of their life are not meeting up to what they wanted or dreamed of. Have you ever been triggered by an event, a person, an image? Have you been triggered by Christmas shopping? Black Friday sales? Yeah? Has a Super Bowl commercial about Jesus triggered you? He gets us, right? Has a political campaign slogan of some candidate triggered you when you hear it or see it? Make America great again. Has seeing a rainbow flag triggered you about someone promoting their sexual orientation? Here's one I like. Has the sight of a pastor with tattoos <laughs> triggered you? This is one I like. Have you ever been triggered by a waiter getting your order wrong at your favorite restaurant? Reminds me of my buddy back home, Boudreaux. Oh, Boudreaux walks into the, his favorite restaurant. The waiter comes up. He goes, Mr. Boudreaux, what are you having today? Boudreaux says, 
Listen, man, I want two hard-boiled eggs, but I want one of them so tough that I can't even chew through it. And I want the other one so runny it just goes all over my plate when I cut into it. I want a piece of toast that's so burnt when I touch it, it crumbles to bits. And I want that butter for that toast to come right out the freezer, so frozen that I can't even spread it over the crumbled bread. And I need my coffee to be so watered down and barely warm that I won't even drink it. The waiter goes, Mr. Boudreaux, this Okay, I'm going to do my best to fulfill that order, but that, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do all that. It's, and Boudreaux goes, man, why is that so hard? That's exactly what you served me when I ordered this yesterday. <laughs> With that, let's look at the Bible. Our text today comes from John chapter 10. Here's what John writes in this encounter with Jesus and the religious leaders. The Jewish leaders surrounded Jesus again and asked this question. How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the son of God, tell us plainly. Jesus responds, I've already told you the truth. You don't believe me. The evidence is in the works I do in the name of my father. But you don't believe me because you're not part of my flock. My sheep recognize my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them away from me, for my, my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. So no one can forcefully take them from me. I and the Father are what? One. Then again, the Jewish leaders picked up stones to kill him. Think they're triggered? Absolutely. And Jesus said, at God's direction, I've done many good works to help the people. Which one of these miracles did I do are you wanting to stone me for? What a great question. And the religious leaders reply, not for any of the good works or the miracles, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, have declared yourself to be God. And here's Jesus' response. In your own law, the Old Testament, it says this. He quotes Psalm 82.6. You can look it up later. He quotes Psalm. He says, if the scripture, which you believe to be true, cannot be destroyed and speaks of individuals as gods because the word of God came to them, do you call it blasphemy when the one selected and sent into the world by the Father says, I am the Son of God? Don't believe me unless I do the work of God. But if I do, at least believe the work, even if you don't believe me then you will become convinced that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And once again, I love this in the Greek, and once again they had a strong desire to take hold of him. They were triggered. But he escaped from their hands and he went beyond the Jordan River to stay near a place where John was first baptizing and many followed him. We'll look at this verse really closely. Point number one, if you're taking notes, is this. When I am unwittedly tied to a lie, I will be undoubtedly triggered by the truth. If I am holding on to something with all of my heart that isn't true, when someone comes and disproves it or shows me that maybe that's incorrect, I will be triggered. See, the Pharisees ask Jesus in verse 24, they say, stop with all the suspense. Tell us plainly. I love that phrase in Greek. Tell us plainly. Are you the son of God or not? That phrase, tell us plainly, this is what it literally should be translated as. Tell us, Jesus, in accordance with our proper functioning rational faculties and our estimation of what is true or not true. And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus. And how he communicates what truth is. Every time Jesus says the word truth in the New Testament, he is using a very specific word. This word is aletheia, which means to uncover, to disclose, to reveal. Here's what it does not mean. It does not mean to validate, to verify. Truth, period. The way Jesus uses the word truth is more like not truth, period. It's truth, dot, 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 an ellipsis. It means we're on this path, this journey. The way I say it in my philosophy class is we are true thing. You can run, but when you are running, right, you are doing something. 
It is an action. See, most of us live in this world where we hold that whatever truth is, is really this logical set of propositions. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's how we think about truth. We have to verify it. But Jesus is speaking not in terms of a framework of argumentation that whoever's best rational explanation wins the debate. No. And it's not some sort of scientific truth where we have repetitive observation and replication of some experiment. And, oh, now that's true. Aspirin takes away headaches or whatever. See, the problem with the Pharisees and their understanding of truth was this. They were self-appointed gatekeepers to truth to the truth about God. And Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, the Messiah, needed to go through them so they would accept it or reject it. They were self-appointed. You ever feel like that today in modern Christianity? Every day I feel that way. I post something from my sermon or something about Jesus, and boy, these gatekeeper Christians come out, oh, Troy, you're worshiping the wrong Jesus. Jesus. I thought there was only one. Well, there's just one. No, Jesus tells him this. I've already told you the truth, not by logical or rational explanation, but by showing it to you, by living it. The evidence is in the work that I am doing. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying very simply to the Pharisees. The truth of who I am and the truth of who you are, isn't something to be logically explained. It is something to be personally experienced. Jesus says, I am the son of God, but so are you. We're all God's children, all of us. And he says this, and this is what really triggers him. He says this in Greek, ego kai putair esmen heis. He says, the father and I are one. And they immediately pick up stones. They are absolutely triggered by this claim of Jesus' identification. Why? Why are they so triggered by that statement? Here's why. Because when people are tied to a self-serving lie, they will be triggered by an earth-shaking truth. And here's the truth that Jesus is espousing. God is not separate from you. God is not out there in the heavens waiting for some personal invitation. God is always already with and in you and waiting to simply have you awaken to that truth so you can live in it. And Jesus says, you know the truth, not by what I say, but what, why I'm doing it. Why did Jesus do miracles? To just prove who he was? No, to prove who God was in the world. Jesus is saying, these miracles happen for a reason to change and transform lives. Imagine if Jesus would have raised people from the dead and no one changed their heart around who God was. His miracles would have been impotent. Even if the guy's back from the dead, people are like, oh, it's great. All of the things, all of the works Jesus did was to show that God lives within us. The statement, the Father and I are one, is not very controversial at all. But it is very dangerous to a particular kind of person. And Jesus clarifies this. He simply says, look, guys, I'm doing the work of God to help people. Which one of those are you wanting to kill me for? It's like Jesus is like literally confused by these religious leaders. He goes, you guys walk around with your, your robes and your fancy dress to claim that you know God and you don't even recognize when God is at work. Recognition is a big thing for humanity. My mom left my, my biological father when I was three years old. I've seen him a handful of times, but he went on, he married another woman years later, had some children, had a couple of boys. And I remember I went to my aunt's house, my mom's, my mom's sister, her name's Debbie, to pick up something for my mom. And I had a cousin, Dustin, who's Debbie's son. And he was playing like Atari on the floor when I knocked on my nanny's door, my Aunt Debbie's door. And she opens the door and I walk in, I'm like, hey, I'm here to pick up this stuff for mom. And I looked down, and this little kid's playing Atari with my, my cousin Dustin. And I went, who the heck are you? And he goes, who are you? It was like I was looking at myself eight years earlier. 
I recognized it. It was undoubted. I was like, and my nanny walks in from the kitchen. She goes, oh, Troy, this is your brother Jared. <laughs> I was like, my brother? She goes, by, by the way. She goes, yeah, your daddy and his wife, this is their son Jared. And I was like, holy, immediately recognized myself in him. Jesus' statement, the Father and I are one, it's a very dangerous statement if you hold on to this God-forsaken lie that believes this, that spiritual authority and identity can only be given to you through a church, through a pastor, through a denomination, or some religious organization. No, no. What, I love what I do for a living because I'm not a gatekeeper. I'm not a gatekeeper. I'm an inspirer. I'm a speaker of truth to awaken within you who you always have already been and for you to be encouraged to live that out. And it's dangerous for those people who feel like, no, we have the truth. And you don't get to it unless I accept or reject your premise. And Jesus is like, baloney. No. My identity is given to me from God, the Almighty. And it doesn't need your acceptance or rejection, guys. It needs people to be awakened to that truth. But here's the other thing about Jesus' statement, the Father and I are one. It's universal. Here's what it means. Not only is that statement true for Jesus, it's true for you and I as well. Me and God are one. What does that mean? I'm God? No. Are you God? No, I'm not worshiping you. But I worship the God that has created you, that has put a piece of himself within you. I and my Father God are one. You know when we're one? When I'm doing his work. Does that mean you got to preach? No. That means you got to love people when they least expect it and even more so when they least deserve it. When I show the love of God to a world that's in pain, not just in my words or my fancy Facebook posts or Instagram stories. No, it is when I'm actually in the practice of loving other people that God becomes real and alive and ignited in my heart and my mind. Here's what I want to say. God and I are on the same page. When I stop trying to convict people with my words and start convincing people with my life. And that's what Jesus is saying. The Father and I are one, and the proof is not just in my words. The proof is in the actions that follow. Point number two. Oh, I love this one. Living out your true identity will often trigger people who can't figure out theirs. You triggered yet? Whatever you call your identity, I, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Whatever it is, I know it's this. It's very fractal. It's like branches of a tree connected to you into directly communities that you associate with or identify with. For instance, my children make me a father. It's my identity. But it's my love for them that makes me a daddy. My marriage makes me a husband to my wife. But it's my love for her that takes that love deeper, right? Think about my work as a pastor. My identity as a pastor is because of what I do here at Suncoast. But imagine if I were one of these pastors that you never see out in, in, in the foyer. Thank you, Siri. What if I were one of these pastors that just hung out in the green room? I'm too spiritual for you guys. I need to get into a holy place before I preach. No, no. Where, where, are, where are Pastor Brett, Pastor Larry, and I on Sunday mornings? Out there hugging necks and shaking hands. And I know after this sermon, some of you guys want to shake my neck, I'm sure. And that's okay. But I want to say this very carefully. Today I don't even identify as a Christian. Because that identity has been so convoluted with different things that have nothing to do with the person and identity of Jesus. Rather, I call myself a follower of Christ, a follower of Jesus, because Christianity over time, because of all the gatekeeping, has simply become believing something by prayer, when following Jesus requires me to become something by practice. Notice the Pharisees, when they identified Jesus, they never call him what everyone else called him. What did other people call him? 
Lord, Rabbi, Son of Man, Son of God. The Pharisees call him blasphemer. Why? Here's why. Because whenever my own identity is unclear, it's going to inevitably blur how I see other people's identity. This is why Jesus says what? Take the log out of what? Your own eye first before you, tr you try to take it out of somebody else's. See, the Pharisees were acting in accordance with their misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the first of the Ten Commandments of Moses. They say, you claim it to be God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But Jesus clarifies this. He, he, he actually retorts to them by using the scripture where he says from Psalm 82. This is what Psalm 82 says. Ye are gods, for ye are the sons and daughters of the most high God. So what is Jesus saying? I'm a son of God. And so are you. So live like it. Behave like it. Love like it. Don't let anyone question your identity because you're so consumed by who you truly are. My identity is not my political associations or affiliations. My identity is not my denominational understanding. My, my identity is not my sexual orientation. My identity is child of God. That is the meta identity of who I live into every day. And anything else is just tangential. It's just extra, superfluous. I want to know I want to know God in the deepest, most intimate way. Not for self-service or egotism, but so that I can make a difference in someone else's life. Jesus does something really remarkable here. You have to have some, some understanding of theology to kind of grasp what he's doing. He's like, you guys are calling me a blasphemer because I call myself the son of God, but we're all children of God. And Jesus says, you can only be a son or daughter of God when you do the work of God. Truth be told, I think Jesus is calling them out. You're calling me out on the first commandment, have no other gods before me. Here's what I'm going to call you out on, the third commandment. Who knows what the third commandment says? Do not take the name of the Lord your God, what? In vain. Many of us think that just simply saying, God, dang it, or whatever. That can mean that if you want. But again, that's just tangential, right? That's just extra. It, that's not what Moses is saying. Here's what that, that actual commandment literally means. The third commandment, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It means do not claim any divine motivation for any behavior that is selfish, narcissistic, self-serving, egotistical, and not considering of others. When you say you come in the name of someone, what does that mean? I'm saved by the name of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven which men can be saved. What does that mean? The name is not just the title or, or the, the indication of a person's identification. I am Troy. When you come in the name of someone, you come in their character. You come in their mission. You come identifying with that person. That is to come in the name of the king, to come in the name of the Son, to come in the name of Jesus. In other words, this is what Jesus is saying. The miracles that I'm performing, the works that I'm doing, the teachings that I have been teaching have been done in the name of God, and it is changing lives. And you guys should have been doing this from the freaking beginning, and you weren't. Because you want to hold the truth of your own subjective idea of what God is. When God is bigger than your truth. God is bigger than your reason. God is bigger than your rational faculties. God is love. And love wins every time. Jesus is calling us to live the truth of his name. Not just to be saved by it. I mean, I say it again. Like, what if Jesus would have performed all these miracles and nobody's lives would have been changed? Who cares? Jesus is calling them, you have taken the name of the Lord your God in vain by coming in his name and having no effect on the world. Jesus lived for 33 years and changed the world. Our life expectancy right now is like 78. What are we doing?
I want to say it like this. Jesus comes and says, I've come to teach you the law of love. But you Pharisees and Sadducees, you gatekeepers, all you want to teach is love of the law. And that's not how it works. That is not how it works. But, but Troy, but Troy, the Bible, the Bible, I don't want to have this biblical identity. With the, great. Let me give you some truths about biblical identity if you're ready. Owning slaves is biblical. Setting slaves free is biblical. But only one of those is Christ-like. Killing your enemies is biblical. Loving your enemies is biblical. But only one of those is Christ-like. Taking revenge for being done wrong is biblical. Forgiving others for being done wrong is also biblical. But only one of those is Christ-like. Beware of identifying with one and not the other. Beware. You triggered yet? Good. Point number three. Even at the end of our God-given mission to love others when they least expect it and deserve it, we need to return to the beginning as God's beloved. What does that mean, Troy? Jesus recognizes after this incident, he is on a short leash. He knows that these, these religious leaders and gatekeepers are so confused about their own identity. So, of course, they're going to be confused about the identity of God's children. Because they, they feel you've got to work your way. You've got to believe certain things, hold certain ideas. Jesus knows I'm about to be arrested. I'm about to have this mockery of a trial. I'm about to be killed. Let me go back to where John was first baptizing. Why does he do that? There's no scholarly search on this. Most scholars just leave. He just went back to where John was baptizing. John was his buddy, his cousin. No, no. He goes back because it's when John baptized Jesus that what? The heavens open. And it says that a dove came upon him and he heard a voice from heaven saying what? You are my beloved son in who I am well pleased. Do you know this? Jesus did not perform any miracles until after his baptism. Until after God confirmed in his heart, you are my beloved son. And yeah, I love the miracles of Jesus, walking on water, raising Lazarus from the dead. We'll talk about that. But here's the thing. God wants to tell, tell you this right now. You are my beloved son, daughter. Go change the world. Go change the world. If you need to be reminded who you are in Christ, in God, go back to where you last experienced him. Maybe it was a church. Maybe it was a youth camp. Maybe it was a beach. Maybe it was a year ago, years ago, maybe a month ago. Maybe today is the first day you're experiencing this awakening of God's love and your true identity in God. Being Christ-like isn't something you accept and didn't believe. It's something you awaken to and then you live out. That's the call. I want to close by telling you this story. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Dallas to watch my daughter. She, she got the lead part in Mary Poppins. She was Mary Poppins in her high school musical. I was so proud, beaming, beaming with pride. My daughter, so talented. I got some time with my son. I said, hey, buddy, what do you want to do? He's like, Dad, I want to play basketball, one-on-one. -on -one. I was like, let's go, bro. Went to a little basketball court. My son is 16 and a half, and he's just as tall as me. And we used to play basketball all the time. And I remember this day, I'm backing into him, and I bump him, Jeff. You know what he does? Bumps me right back. <laughs> little sucker. But I felt his strength. I go up for a layup. You know what he does? Get that shot out of here. I'm like, what the? He's got the ball. It's game point. He turns around, does a little fadeaway jumper to win, to beat me. Nails it. I was like, what the hell's going on in my life? True story. When he hit that shot, 
He didn't brag or boast. He didn't be like, oh, in your face, Dad. He looks at me like, I did it. I didn't let him win. I didn't want him to win. He knew he could do it. Something shifted in his heart, in his mind, like, I, I, I've played you a million times, Dad, and you've beat me every time. But I beat you on my own. I think that's the call of God on your heart right now, in this moment, in this second. God is saying, you can do it. You can love others, even if you don't want to. You can change somebody's life by simply smiling at them. You can change somebody's life by giving them a hug, a high five. You can, do so, you can help somebody. I know right now there are people in this room who need some sort of help, whether it's a new dryer, a new car, something. You need a bill paid. I don't know what it is. And there's someone in this room who can meet that need and change your life. And when we're open to that spirit of God moving and awakening within us, somehow we gravitate toward those people that we need to meet. We need to help. I think God is telling us today, Suncos, you can do it. Just like my son, he knows now he can beat me. You can do it. You can live it. You are already loved. Now go and live in that truth. Let me pray for you, Suncos. Father, I pray for my friends, my family, this community. God, that we would awaken to the truth. We can do it. We can do it. We have the spirit of Christ living and existing and breathing and moving within us. So God, let us awaken to that truth. Let us not deny that identity anymore, but live fully into it. Give us the strength and give us the courage to do that today, God. It's in the strong name of Jesus I pray this. Amen. Go in peace, Sun Coast. We'll see you.